Last week we witnessed Jesus calling his first disciples. There was four of them. This illustrated for us the call to discipleship. You know, the call to discipleship we saw is high. But the benefits, the rewards are exceedingly higher. The call to discipleship is high, but the reward is exceedingly higher. Jesus taught with authority, unlike any man who had ever walked the earth before him. As he taught, he astonished those who heard him. Have you ever been astonished? I mean much more than just been impressed. We can be impressed by a beautiful sunset or impressed by a certain piece of music. We can be impressed by a lot of things. But I I caught myself as I was going through this. Have I ever really been astonished? Where I just could not speak. I was so amazed. I was so stunned. I struggled to think of a time. I titled this message, What is this? What is this? A direct quote from the text. In our text, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Mark uses this account to showcase Jesus as the divine Messiah. Let's read and see it for ourselves. Mark 1, beginning in verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out in a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits And they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Jesus astonished the people with his teaching and mastery over evil, revealing who he was. I'm going to tell you up front what I believe our response to this message should be. That we recognize Jesus as the divine Messiah that we bow in astonishment at the authority of who he is. Would you pray with me? Our God, we want to recognize how great you are, how mighty you are. God, as we read this account, as we study it, Lord, as I proclaim it, I pray that it would be clear, God, the divine Messiah coming to earth. God, I pray that we would be amazed. I pray that you would press this upon us, God, and that we would worship you as a result. In your holy name, amen. Three points to this message. The first is that Jesus astonished the people with his teaching. Verse 21 says, And they came, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue, and he was teaching. So that's the setting. They're in Capernaum, which is in the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. So they're still in Jesus' home province of Galilee. And they're in the same region where Jesus, we saw him last week, where he's calling his disciples. Capernaum was probably where these disciples that are now disciples lived. We know that Peter, for instance, was from Bethsaida, but they probably came to this place of Capernaum for the fishing industry. There was a rich fishing industry there. Uh, It was a, is a, a city in Galilee relative to Galilee. It was a a fairly populated city, a fairly wealthy city. They would have had artisans and merchants and so on. There was a fair amount of activity there. So this was quite different from Jesus' little town of Nazareth. So they're there in this significant fishing industry town, and that's the setting here. Don't forget that the disciples are with him. It's easy for us to only think about the others in the synagogue, but when it says they, that first one there in verse 21, the context seems to be the disciples with Jesus. They came into Capernaum. We see the same thing that they're still with him in verse 29 in the passage we'll see next week. And actually Jesus is going to their home. So Jesus is teaching. And the thing I want to say is get used to this because we're going to see this a lot 
over and over again. He's going to be teaching throughout the gospel. This is, this is what Jesus came to do was to proclaim. And so we see him constantly teaching. Sometimes he's teaching his disciples. Sometimes he's teaching a large crowd. Sometimes he's teaching from a boat. Sometimes he's teaching on a mountain. But Jesus is teaching all the time. So we want to get used to this. At any given moment, this is what Jesus is doing in the gospels. There are a whole lot of other things that he's going to do, but so much of it comes down to his proclamation. In fact, Jesus' ministry has proclamation at its center. You know by now what he's proclaiming, don't you? He's proclaiming the kingdom. We saw that in verse 15. We're going to see it today worked out. He is proclaiming the kingdom. He'll do many things, many great, wonderful things that we don't want to miss. But even these miraculous works, for instance, that he's doing, They all illustrate the message that he's proclaiming. So we never want to see the miracles in a vacuum as if that's all he's doing and they don't have any relation to these other things because they do. Jesus taught here as a visiting rabbi. And so that tells us something about the relationship that Jesus has with the disciples and the stature that he has in the community to be able to stand up there and teach as a rabbi. Uh, the synagogue where they are was uh, the local place where Jews in any, gather, uh, any given city would gather. So this is not the temple in Jerusalem. So this is not a big, glamorous, beautiful place. But it's just the, like, kind of like a local church. Basically, all you needed in any given community to have a Jewish synagogue was about 10, roughly 10 Jewish families, maybe a dozen Jewish families. But this city of Capernaum probably had a decent-sized synagogue. Archaeologists have looked at it, but... And, and be able to have been able to show some of that. But just the fact that Capernaum was a, a decently sized town for the region. So visiting rabbis would commonly come into the synagogues and would teach. Think about the order of service there. The synagogue worship would begin with prayer. Then there would be a, re- a reading from the scriptures, from the writings, from the prophets, from the law. And then there would be a homily and then a benediction. Sounds a lot like us. Right? You know, like they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, really, the worship services haven't changed that much. The Christians basically are going to follow the same pattern that the Jews had because they're coming out of Judaism. And so that's the basic process we see there. And so Jesus is doing the homily part. So basically, Jesus is going to take that time. Do you know what a homily is? If you go to a Roman Catholic church, that's basically what you get as your message. Uh, the, in a Catholic church, the Eucharist is the height of the service. The Lord's Supper is the height of the service. The homily is... is Fairly brief, 5, 10, 15 minutes at most usually. And it's usually just sort of a walking commentary talking about something in the Bible. So this probably would have been more than that, but that's basically what it is. Jesus is taking a text of scripture and he's expounding it. When the text refers to Jesus' teaching, it's referring to this homily there. Look at verse 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. The scriptures are very clear here that Jesus' teaching is astonishing them because of its authority. They could feel it. They could sense it. They were astonished. And, and even this word, I mean, I, at the beginning I was trying to impress upon you, have you ever been astonished? Do you know what astonishment is? But even that English word doesn't seem to really convey what's in the original Greek word, the original language. It was a deep sense of amazement and awe, sort of that, that kind that leaves your jaw hanging open. You don't know what to say. And you see them later, they're like, what is this? They don't even know what to say. They're in such amazement. You're saying, really? That must have been quite some teaching. What, what was he saying? Well, Mark's not going to emphasize so much of what he was saying, but how he was saying it. Jesus, his teaching itself brings some form of, of authority, doesn't it? Uh, anyone who is standing before someone teaching gives some sense that that guy knows more than we do and we want to learn from him. Uh, whether it's you're at you know, driver's training school and you've got to hear the guy, he's apparently supposed to be a professional in driving, or if you're at a formal school down the road at a high school, the, the teacher is supposed to know things that he wants to teach you. So, so teaching in and of itself has some form of authority. We recognize that. In our culture, I just know this at the, at the side, we have even become uneasy with the idea of teaching in general. Even with how we do education, uh, a lot of that's changed. This is especially true in universities. I've, I've sensed this even working at a university. Uh, students, especially once they become young adults, they don't want a teacher, they don't want a sage on the stage. They want a guide on the side. Don't teach me. Just just kind of walk with me and we'll kind of learn together. Because in our, in our postmodern 
radically autonomous, radically independent culture. We, we just don't want anyone telling us what to do. And so we note that. But in this culture, they wouldn't have grappled with that so much. It's, it's not that he was teaching, but how he was teaching. And indeed, in some sense, what he was teaching that amazed the people. Note that plural pronoun there. It says they were amazed. This might only look, just grammatically could be referring to the disciples initially, but just contextually, it does seem to be the whole group that is hearing him is amazed. But I also note that to say, this is the first time disciples have heard him teach in a formal way. So they've probably heard him say things. He's been walking with them, but they're sitting there and there. This man whom they've abandoned all these things to follow after is now teaching in this way. And so they're included in this amazement as they're looking at Jesus. This was not like the, the scribes, it says. This is not at all like the scribes who were basically the scholars. Uh, they were the PhDs. They were the great thinkers of the age, and they were revered. They definitely were revered. Uh, in our context, in our culture, we value uh, novelty. We don't, uh, we, we don't necessarily appreciate things in the past. Few of us do. Our culture as a whole always wants something new, Right? When the latest smartphone comes out, our old phone is obsolete. We've got to get a new one. Uh, with movies, if we've seen that movie once, ah, I'm done. I want to see another one. We just always have this desire for novelty when it comes to dress. Oh, we don't want to dress like those people. We want to have our own style. So just in our culture, we value novelty. But I note that to say they, they didn't. They valued tradition. So as the scribes taught, they didn't seek to to come up with new ideas. They sought to look back at tradition. And so they would quote, uh, Rabbi so-and-so, teacher so-and-so, is what the the only thing. And of course, the scriptures themselves that gave them strength in their discussions. But Jesus does not follow the scribes. Listen to this. Jesus' own words carry the foremost authority. As the divine Messiah, as the Son of God, he comes and does something and has a position unlike those who have come before them. So he doesn't need to quote Rabbi so-and-so. He doesn't need to quote anyone other than even him own, his own self. And you say, well, what about the Bible? He's quoting the scriptures, isn't he? As he quotes the scriptures, he's quoting himself. He's God. God inspired the scriptures. And so it's just an incredible thing for us to ponder here that Jesus is God. They had never witnessed this. That's, is, it's this that is making them, uh, making them go into a state of astonishment. R.C. Sproul says this. He says, scribes had some authority. They were learned. They were revered by the people. But when Jesus spoke, he evoked an authority far beyond anything the people had experienced with the scribes. The scribes could cite scholars and rabbinic traditions. They could try to marshal arguments to support what they were teaching, just as we try to do today in the academic world. But Jesus did not do that. He provided no footnotes, no citations, no marshaling of other people's arguments. And he makes a joke here. He says uh, his teaching, Jesus' teaching, might have inspired bumper stickers on their chariots in those days that said, Jesus says it, that settles it. When God says something, the argument is over. This is an amazing thought for us. Jesus' hearers could feel this. They felt the authority in Jesus' words. What do you feel when you hear God's word? Even as we read this text this morning, what do you feel when you hear, when you read God's word? Do you recognize its authority? It's unique power. Think about this. I often think about this. Liberal scholars, think about liberal Protestantism that's coming out of Europe and America over the last 200, 250 years. They've done everything they could. Again, the whole idea behind liberalism, they were not trying to destroy the church. They did not see themselves as enemies of the church. They wanted to update the church for the modern world. And so in, in theory, you think, oh, well, that sounds like a good thing. They said that old superstitious religion doesn't fit. We're going to make Christianity an enlightened religion. And so those miracles and all that, you know, superstitious stuff, we're going to get rid of that. But we want the morals of the Bible. And so, so they were doing away with what they saw as obsolete forms of Christianity in a new form of religion. 
They say the Bible is not inerrant. Of course it's not inerrant. It's not inspired by God in any special way. Uh, it was, it's no different than the other religious works of the world. So they've done everything they could on, on one hand to sort of deny and cut away at the Bible, right? But they can't get rid of it. And by that, I mean they aren't willing to give it up because they've felt its power. So in some evil intent, they want to undermine it. They want to deny it. But even the most, even the most vicious liberal I can think of names, and I'm not going to name them. You wouldn't know them anyway, probably. But they can't escape this book. Because even if they don't follow it, even if in their heart they rage against it, they know there's power here. Mark does not tell us the exact content of what Jesus is teaching here. He tends to do that. He emphasizes how Jesus taught. He taught with authority. The overall message that Jesus taught is not in question, though. As I said, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. Again, think back to verse 15 and what he's doing there. Like a prophet, Jesus said, thus saith the Lord. But unlike the prophets, the Lord himself now stood before them. So as much as we would have thought, wow, how amazing to have seen Moses or Elijah and and Jeremiah and so on to see these great prophets used by God in mighty ways. They said, thus saith the Lord, and God did speak through them. But now God himself stands before them. It's an incredible thought. Jesus astonished the people with his teaching. There's a second part to their astonishment. First began with the teaching, and now, number two, Jesus astonished the people with his power. This passage is the first of several accounts of Jesus' healings that we're going to see in Mark. In fact, we'll be seeing it for the next several weeks. Jesus is going to be doing a lot of healing. We should ask ourselves, and probably some of you are, why did Jesus heal these people? Is there any theological significance? Was, Was Jesus simply healing these people because he's a nice guy? Sometimes our reading of the Bible might be shallow enough that we don't ask these questions, but you should. Let me encourage you. You should ask yourself these questions. What's the significance of this? Was this just Jesus showing uh, a sense of compassion? Well, that's, that's more possible. But what we're going to see here is that there's much more to it. Jesus' healings are directly connected to his proclamation of the kingdom. The healings show who he is and why he's here. Verse 23. The text says, And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. This kind of happens out of nowhere, right? The same way, and immediately. It's Mark's way of saying, out of nowhere, this, this whole thing goes down. Out of nowhere, they're sitting there, Jesus is teaching, maybe it's at the conclusion, maybe it's halfway through Jesus' teaching, the homily, and they just start screaming, they start going crazy, this guy. Think of where this is happening. It's, It's in a synagogue. This is the last place you'd expect this to happen, right? Is this irony? Is Mark sort of pushing some irony here? There's a demon in a man in a synagogue? More likely, what I think is going on here is a desperation on the part of the demonic forces. Mark Strauss, one commentator of this text, says, The presence of a demon in the synagogue is shocking, since this is a place of prayer and devotion to God. But desperate circumstances call for desperate actions, and Satan's forces are intent on defeating the Son of God before his full mission begins. You notice that, that in the Old Testament, you don't see a lot of demonic activity. Oh, there's some stuff in Samuel. We, we see some things. There's certainly plenty going on in the spiritual realm. But all of a sudden, in the New Testament, demons seem like there's just stuff going on all over the place. Why is that? Well, they realize what's going on with Jesus coming. They're doing everything they can to undermine it. But you see, they... I mean, how foolish of them to think that they could possibly derail what God is doing. It doesn't stop them from trying, though, does it? It doesn't stop them from trying. 
There's a man with an evil spirit here. Uh, Some translations will say unclean spirit. Now the ESV is saying unclean spirit. There's some other ways it's translated. But evil spirit makes better sense. The idea of unclean might sort of confuse us to think that this is talking about ceremonial washings with the Old Testament law. It's not that this man is ceremonially unclean. He's possessed by a demon. Verse 23, sort of the latter point there. There's a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? So the demon is calling out. He's calling out through this man. This man is basically anonymous to us, by the way. We don't know his name. We don't know much about him. And even at the end, he's just sort of a passive uh, backdrop to this story. But the demon clearly seems to have full possession of this man. So he's speaking through him. So to some of the people around, they probably and might not fully understand what's going on. They might think that this dude's crazy just at this point. Jesus fully knows what's going on. But this is a frightening thought, isn't it? That this man is a passive vessel for a demon. Now, for some charismatics or Pentecostals, they might go, that's right, yeah, this happens all the time. In our circles, this, this is a little odd for us because we don't always talk about this. We, we believe it, we know it's here, but we don't talk about it very often. Notice the demon says us. What does he mean by that? It seems to be just one. Could possibly be that he's implying that he's not alone. He sort of has reserves in the area, there's other demonic activity in the area. What might be going on is that he's referring to the whole of the demonic kingdom. Because he knows that Jesus' assault is coming against the entire kingdom of darkness. Let's never forget that this is real. There is a kingdom of darkness present and at work in this world. Church, if, if we don't recognize this... Or if we wrongly underemphasize this, we put ourselves in a vulnerable position. I'm not suggesting that we become paranoid or excessive. We, we don't ever want to swing to that extreme either. We see here that God has complete power over the adversary and the whole of the demonic kingdom. But we must remember in the words of the Apostle Paul that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood against principalities in the heavenly realm. There is a spiritual realm around us and there is evil within it. We must take those precautions. And so you ask me, well, what do we do? Well, the first thing that we have to do is we need to pray. We know the one to whom we pray has control over that realm. And in this way, and I'm getting ahead of myself, he has conquered that realm. But we must not forget that it is still there. It's on its last limb. It's on its way out, but it's still there. There's still a threat. The demon recognizes that Jesus is on a mission. This is not a game for Jesus. Jesus is not on vacation for a few years on earth. I mean, that that would be crazy. Uh, For Jesus to go on vacation to earth, I mean, that would be like someone who lives in Hawaii going on vacation to a dump somewhere, you know? I mean, why would Jesus is in the glory of all heaven, the eternal son of God? He's not just hanging out on earth for fun. He has a very eternal purpose on this planet, in the things that he's doing. So they're asking him these questions. And even, they're not exactly sure why he's here, but they know that it's profound. And they want to do everything they can to undermine it. So that's why we're going to see this. We see these forces of darkness coming against Jesus. He's not scared, he's not nervous, but they are coming against him. And so that's why we see the rise of activity. Because you might ask yourself, and again, a good question to ask of the, of the text, well, why don't we see all that stuff today? Again, some of our charismatic friends would say, well, we do. Maybe we do. But there was something else unique going on here at this time. The demon asks, have you come to destroy us? In verse 24, uh, they're ignorant to the fact that Jesus has come to destroy the power of sin and death once and for all. He's come to redeem mankind from sin to the praise of his glorious grace. The demon recognizes something that's very, very important for us. He recognizes who Jesus is both in his humanity and in his divinity. Notice that. He says, I know you are Jesus of Nazareth. That's the man. Jesus is a man. He's human. He was born. 
He had toes, he had hair, he had fingers, he got sick, he got tired. He was fully man. It's not just that he appeared to be man, he was. So they recognize that you're Jesus of Nazareth. They quote his hometown. But they also recognize, he also recognizes that Jesus is the Holy One of God. He's God's son. He's God's son. So what a beautiful picture here. But how ironic it's coming from the mouth of a demon. God can work in ways that we don't quite expect. Jesus is fully God. He has has two natures. One is fully human. Genuinely human. Not just appears to be human, but genuinely human. And he has a nature that is divine. Fully divine. God of very God. The demons recognize this. And, and it's not like they're even afraid to say it. I mean, it, it's obvious to them. But again, I can't help but think about this because the Gospels have always been the whipping boy or the, the easiest target. And even that's not the best way to say it. It's been the favorite target of liberal scholars. They just love to tear apart the Gospels. The liberal scholars have stumbled over this for 200 years, but the demons get it. Men who claim to be experts in the word of God and indeed know many things about the word of God and yet hear these demons know more than they do. Again, I, I can't get away from the irony of that. Would you look at verse 25 with me? But Jesus rebuked them, rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. Jesus commanded him. Really, that's the better way to express that. It is a rebuke in a sense, but Jesus is commanding him. He's giving him, 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 he's giving him a command. He says, be quiet. Jesus shuts him up. We might wonder on one level, there's a commentator who's sort of saying something like this. We might wonder why Jesus wouldn't be happy about the free publicity, right? That's right. That's who I am, Nux. You know, why, why, did, why is Jesus so mad? He tells him, he says, no, quiet. What the demon's saying is true. He's the son of God. He's the holy one of God. He's Jesus of Nazareth. Why wouldn't Jesus be grateful for the free advertisement? Well, that's not what Jesus was here for. This, I mean, just how, how silly of us to think. But if Jesus really wanted to get people's attention, he could do that from heaven. He could do that in the skies. He didn't need to come and be human and go through all the things that he did. Jesus isn't on like a, a some sort of um, a t- some trip for attention. Jesus commanded him, get out of him. Verse 26. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. So the spirit obeys, ultimately. What we see here is that the Son of God holds sovereignty over demonic forces, even in the incarnation. Again, we could tend to think, oh, but but he's man, he's human, and so is is he. Yeah, we know he's still really God, but, but Jesus is showing his mastery over the demonic forces, even in the flesh, even in the incarnation. So when Jesus casts out this demon, he does so as a demonstration of his proclamation of the kingdom. Strauss says, these actions are in the service of the proclamation of the kingdom. I like that. They are in the service of the proclamation of the kingdom. Churches, we seek to apply this. Our response should not be, Go forth and cast out demons. That's, that's not Mark's point. That's not how we apply this to our lives. In response, we acknowledge the coming of the kingdom. Jesus' whole point, Mark's whole point. We acknowledge it and we call, we long for its consummation when it'll be finalized. We acknowledge uh, the thing that this episode illustrates. So if we so take this, this episode here, these, these eight uh, verses, if we sort of take them out of context, we can just see this is an interesting supernatural work Jesus is doing. He's a great teacher. But this is in Jesus' work of the kingdom. Jesus astonished the people with his teaching. Indeed, 
Then in this shocking event, he astonishes them with his power over the demonic forces. But now in these remaining two verses, Mark looks deeper into their general astonishment. He wants to emphasize it all the more. And so here's my third and final point. They were astonished. Uh, Mark is sort of reaching a crescendo here, if you know what that is in music. He's, pretty, he's reaching the height here of this, of this passage. He's, he's going to take their amazement to a new level. We already know they're astonished. I mean, I've hit that twice now. But he's going to uh, say all the more and emphasize this. So this is fitting with the text as I follow this in my outline. So look at verse 27. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So they're just floored here. That'd be a good way to to translate this word. It's a different word than what we saw earlier, but they're just floored. They don't know what to think. Notice Mark clearly refers now to the whole assembly. Earlier, he's just saying they, just a simple pronoun. But here he emphasizes they were all amazed. Everybody was amazed. They'd never seen anything like this. They've not really been involved up to this point, have they? We, we don't hear anything from the people present. They're just watching. Again, their sort of jaws are hanging open. They're watching this. But now here they speak for the first time. They ask themselves, the namesake of my title, what is this? We add a question mark. There's no question mark in the original language, but that's sort of the idea is, what in the world? It's kind of what they're saying. This tells us something that we should already know that this kind of stuff didn't happen on a regular basis. We sometimes, again, part of this is just a legacy of, of liberal scholarship that's, that's still pervaded among us, that we sometimes have this idea that, oh, well, these, you know, these ancient people, they just thought this kind of stuff happened all the time. So they must have just been like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. You know, like, like Kermit drinking his tea in that meme, you know. It's sort of like, no big deal. Oh, this happens all the time. You know, it's just, no, it didn't. Notice how amazed they are. We notice later in the Gospels when Jesus is doing works that some people who physically see his works with their eyes still can't believe it. These aren't stupid ancient people. They were highly intelligent people, no less intelligent than we are, maybe more intelligent than we are. They didn't have iPhones. They had to do things themselves. So I explain that to say we should sense the weight of what's happening here. This is not just another day for them. It's not just a, a, another Saturday. What are they most shocked about? Well, we would guess, surely they'd, they'd be the most shocked about the, the, the demon, right? And, and the exorcism there. It's not what the text implies. They are astonished first at his teaching. Look at that there in the text. A new teaching with authority. It's the first thing that they say. That seems to be the emphasis here. That, that's counter to what we would expect. And these are Jews. Jews are always calling for signs. We see that in 1 Corinthians, that the Jews are amazed by mighty acts. But they're astonished at his teaching. This should reorient the way we think about Jesus' ministry. Well, we think about things like the feeding of the 5,000, and that was an incredible thing. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. What an incredible thing. Just in the next passage, in in verse 29 and following, he goes and he takes Peter's mother-in-law, touches her by the hand, and heals her. So so those things are amazing. But we should reorient to think the thing that shocked them the most was his teaching. We're often amazed at miracles. But these miracles do not stand alone. Jesus is not on a quest to wow people. Again, there's a lot bigger things he could have done. He could have sort of done what he's going to do in Revelation, rode a horse, opened his mouth, and fire and a sword comes out of it and just destroys all of his enemy. That's going to be a wow moment. But feeding people? I mean, that's, that's incredible for us. But to God, what is that? We should reorient our thinking here. Jesus comes with a message. Pay close attention to it, church. This message means life or death. Eternal life and eternal death. 
The people are astonished at his mastery over the realm of darkness. Indeed, they are. But these two things go together. One commentator says, Jesus' primary mission is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. The exorcisms and healings are not showy displays of his power for self-aggrandizement, but evidence that the power of the kingdom is breaking into human history through the Messiah's words and deeds. Jesus' healing miracles do not simply remedy human maladies. It's not just healing people. They represent a war against demonic forces. When we think about kingdom, and we use that word, sometimes we forget the weight of it. Kingdom against kingdom, that means war. By God's grace, we have not seen war in our lifetimes in a significant way that has involved us, but most people, many people in the world would get that. We live in a very comfortable place by God's grace, but this is war. God didn't have to come to earth to heal people. Again, we know going all the way back to Exodus. In the book of Exodus, God says, I am the God who heals you, speaking to Israel. We see all kinds of miraculous things happen in the Old Testament by the prophets and so on. God didn't have to come here to do that. There's something much greater going on. We don't want to get caught up in the miracles in the wrong way. They're true. They happen. They're important. But we see them in the context of Jesus' ministry. So I highlight that as we look into these over the next coming weeks. Look at verse 28. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So Jesus will be ministering here in Galilee for the foreseeable future for quite a while until much later in the book. This account is about Jesus. Don't miss that. Again, even the person that has been delivered here, we don't know his name. We don't know anything about him. We don't know where he goes after. It's not about the man. The man remains anonymous. Mark only presents him as a backdrop. Jesus is the hero and focal point of this story. Notice here, his fame spread far and wide. Everyone was talking about it. It it reminded me about 2009 when Joy and I were living in southeast Louisiana. If you know anything about NFL football, the New Orleans Saints don't have a long track record of being a great team. No one was talking about the Saints as a powerhouse before 2009. Nobody. A lot of people aren't talking about them right now. But in 2009, they went to the Super Bowl for the first time. We were living there at the time, and I'm telling you, the area was just electric. I've never experienced anything like that. And I lived here in the Bay Area when the Niners won like three, you know, uh, Super Bowls. And it still, it just, there was nothing like it. There's not a whole lot of great things that happen in New Orleans. Usually bad things happen in New Orleans. Remember, this is just a few years after Katrina. They're still rebuilding in 2009. And so to have this go on, it was just, everyone was talking about it. They won the NFC championship, the NFC South championship, the division championship. And you think that they would have won the Super Bowl. I mean, people were just nuts. You think Mardi Gras was a big thing. It was incredible. Everyone was talking about it. Same thing here. In Galilee, from Capernaum to Bethsaida to Nazareth, everyone was talking about this guy, Jesus, this thing we saw. We, we heard him teaching and, and what he was saying just impressed upon our hearts and we felt as if it was God speaking to us. He healed this man who was possessed by a demon. I mean, everyone was talking about it. Everyone. Mark Strauss says, Mark's point is that the exorcism reveals Jesus' authority to accomplish his central mission and message, the proclamation and inauguration of the kingdom of God. Satan's realm is being beaten back at the advance of God's kingdom. Church, Mark uses this account to showcase Jesus as the divine Messiah, and he's on a mission. After witnessing Jesus' power over the spiritual realm, they looked at each other and they said, what is this? We might ask ourselves the same question. Let me tell you what this is. Jesus is declaring the arrival of the kingdom of God. Since Adam and Eve's fall into sin in the garden, that means all of human history, since then, humanity has been bound in depravity against God. Bound. We had no hope of escape. We were locked in rebellion. That's all we knew how to do. 
God being rich in mercy, formed a plan of redemption, even from eternity. It's an amazing thought too. Ephesians chapter 1, that he chose us in him before the foundations of the world were laid. He makes a plan of redemption. The father sent the son. The son came obediently into a world of problems that he had not created, rather that man had created. The problems. He came, he became one of us to save us. Went to the cross, gave his life as a sacrifice to reconcile us to God. He died, God raised him from the dead on the third day. And now he resides in heaven, glorified, wielding power over the entire cosmos. He is the king of the cosmos. I don't have a tattoo, but if I did, it'd probably be that. He is the king of the cosmos. <laughs> Jesus represents your hope for salvation. Without Christ, as you sit here, if you sit here without Christ, your only prospect is eternal judgment. There is no third way. But in Christ, for those of us who have repented and believed, in Christ, heaven and God himself is your reward. If you put your faith in Christ as Savior, repent of your sins, turning away from your sins, and follow after Christ, you will be saved. Jesus astonished the people with the teaching and mastery over evil, revealing who he was. Church, may we respond in faith by recognizing Christ as Messiah and bow in astonishment at the authority of who he is. Let's pray.